appreciate being again with you and recognize the president of present plague. Can I just say at this point, President Plague, my wife has something for you. <laughs> it's something that President Gruber sent down from Alpine. And uh, you could just kind of keep that in mind, and after the meeting, she'll be happy to give it to you. <clears throat> this evening, we want to spend the three hours or thereabouts that we have <clears throat> on the subject of Christ coming to Zion, to the Jews, and to the world. <clears throat> And since this uh, topic is immediately associated with us and our responsibility, I'd like to spend the first part of the time focusing now on the prophetic events in the latter days in relation to Christ's coming, not just as general prophetic events. <clears throat> and uh, to begin with, to say that uh, we are confronted with several major challenges, and as is the case with <clears throat> most people, I think it was either Pogo or Penis or someone in the, in the funny strips who says, we've met the enemy and he's us. <clears throat> and uh, the work of building the kingdom of God then, by and large, has its greater, greatest obstacle and our own personal weaknesses, and I'll stand at the head of the list on that one, and our own need to prepare our lives. President Benson, for example, on occasion said this, It is easy to despair when we see about us the moorings of society slipping. Now, how often do we see that? A five or ten year period of time you can just assess uh, the eroding of our society. He says, We must remember, however, that the Lord sent his saints into the world to be a light unto the world and to be the saviors of men. This is a time when Zion must arise and put on her beautiful garments. The contrast between the church and the world will be increasingly marked in the future, which contrast we hope will cause the Church to be more attractive to those in the world who desire to live according to God's plan for his children. Now, Nephi talks of a great division to take place, and we're in the developing era of that great division between the saints and the world. President Benson, another statement by him, the Lord in his mercy has provided a way of escape the voice of warning is to all people by the mouths of his servants. If this voice is not heeded, the angels of destruction will increasingly go forth, and the chastening hand of Almighty God will be felt upon the nations as decreed until a full end thereof will be the result. That's what section 87 says, full end of all nations. Wars, devastations, and untold suffering will be your lot, except you turn unto the Lord in humble repentance. Destruction even more terrible and far-reaching than attended the last great war will come with certainty unless rulers and people alike repent and cease their evil and godless ways. And then another statement by President Benson. He's talking about this now in relation to America. The eventual destiny of America has also been revealed to God's prophets. To Joseph Smith, the Lord revealed that the whole of America is Zion itself from the north to the south. Further, the Lord declared this land to be the place of the new Jerusalem, which should come down out of heaven. Speaking of it in final sense, after the earth is celestialized the holy sanctuary of the Lord, to serve God's eternal purposes and to prepare his land for Zion, God established the constitution of this land by the hands of wise men whom he raised up, 
and redeemed the land by the shedding of blood. And then along with that, we need to pay serious attention to one of the finest statements that we've had made in modern times by a living prophet. It ranks in its uh, importance and the insight that's within it with such great declarations as the Sermon on the Mount and it's President Benson's discourse on Beware of Pride. I don't know how many of you folks have read it and what effect it had. But I'll tell you when I read it, it had a tremendous impact on my soul. I could see myself in every paragraph. And I haven't quite seen myself in that light before. And in his statement, he says, for example, ties this now into the theme we're following. My dear brethren and sisters, we must prepare to redeem Zion. It is essentially the sin of pride that kept us from establishing Zion in the days of the prophet Joseph Smith. It was the same sin of pride that brought the consecration to an end among the Nephites. Pride is the great stumbling block to Zion. I repeat, pride is the great stumbling block to Zion. We must cleanse the inner vessel by conquering pride. We must yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. And that's the key. Put off the prideful natural man. Become a saint to the atonement of Christ the Lord. And become as a child submissive, meek, and humble. And in his discourse, then, he deals rather importantly with many issues. He says, for example, the Lord warns us in the Doctrine and Covenants, and this is section 38, verse 39, Beware of pride, lest you become as the Nephites of old. He says, The central feature of pride is enmity, enmity toward God, and enmity toward our fellow men. Enmity means hatred toward hostility to or a state of opposition. It is the power by which Satan wishes to reign over the earth. We're told that in sacred places, are we not? Pride is essentially competitive in nature. We pit our will against God. When we direct our pride toward God, it is in the spirit of my will and not thy will be done. As Paul said, they seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Our will is competition. Our will, is, our will in competition to God's will allows desires, appetites, and passions to go unbridled. The pride cannot accept the authority of God, giving direction to their lives. He says they pit their perceptions of truth against God's great knowledge, their abilities versus God's priesthood power their accomplishments against his mighty works. Our enemy to the word God takes on many labels, such as rebellion, hard-heartedness, stiff-neckedness, unrepentant, puffed up, easily offended, sign-seekers, the proud wish God would agree with them. They aren't interested in changing their opinions to agree with God's. Another major portion of this very prevalent sin of pride is enemy toward our fellow men. We are tempted daily to elevate ourselves above others and to diminish others. The proud make every man uh, their adversary by pitting their intellects, opinions, works, wealth, talents, or any other worldly measuring device against others. In the words of C.S. Lewis, pride gets no pleasure out of having something only out of having more of it than the next man. And that's true of intellectuality, it's true of material works, you name it's even true of righteousness. We're humbly proud of our righteousness. And he says, once the element of competition is gone, pride is gone. The proud do not receive counsel or correction easily. The proud depend upon the world to tell them whether they have value or not. See? Well, there's a lot of good things in this. And so I say, we've met the enemy, and he's us. And we need them more fully and, and completely than to come into the depths of humility and to submit our will to Christ. And that means submit our will 
to priesthood authority, to the living prophet, to our bishops, to our state presidency, to our high council, and walk in unity and, and get rid of the hobby horses in our midst, and simply focus in on having a solid, meaningful interplay spiritually with our priesthood leaders, and love the brethren, as John would say, by this we may know that you're really there, that you love the brethren. Now, the work before us, then, is a further development of God's work among the people of the world, and that's, we need to put ourselves in perspective and in context. For the last ten years, I spend devoting my full time going back to my major theme in my doctoral study, uh, which is in the area of political thought and political theory and political history, particularly American political thought and its origins, far back as the Renaissance, and the circumstances that I saw at that time and still see. Or do we need to have a correct perspective of where we came from as a nation? And as I see the picture there, the whole historical picture has been critically garbled, and we've literally been fed a bag of garbage in our higher educational programs. So I said, hey, I'm just one of mine among others, but I spent ten years on the project, and I'm talking about five o'clock in the morning until late in the evening every day, six days a week, for that length of time. And I've had a beautiful experience. I've had the spirit of revelation and the every day be able to attack that task and get on that folding chair. I don't like anything else. Wore one out and a couple out. And feel the flow of the Spirit. Just feel the flow. And rejoice the fact that the Lord at least knows what I'm doing and maybe can help me out. And has done, really. I call it, when it gets born, the revolution called liberty. And uh, the gist of the whole thing is that solid historical evidence. In fact, this is the only historical picture. It isn't just a school of thought. It is the school, the only one. And that is that American liberty is born of Christ. And it was born among people who committed themselves wholly to Christ and who lived to the best of their ability in tune with his Holy Spirit. And out of that background brought forth liberty, and did so, first of all, ecclesiastically within the church organizations, within the orders of congregational societies, and then transferred those basic principles, which were principles of liberty, principles that said that society is subordinate to the individual and should be the instrument of the individual in preserving his rights and uh, granting him the privileges of his God-given dignity and transferring those concepts and ideas to the realm of political thought. And then the Lord in his goodness raised up great men, for example, like John Milton, we think of him as a poet that is one of the great revolutionaries of his day in political thought and social thought. Men like John Locke, the great John Locke, who, if you had to choose one man who is back of the American Constitution as one single figure who uh, best expressed the basic ideas, that man was John Locke. But he got his ideas from these liberal Puritans who uh, committed themselves to Christ. And he elevated those basic ideas to the intellectual plane. So that when we get into the early 18th century and on up through into the time of the American Revolution, John Locke's two treatises on government were the basic political texts of American colleges and universities. And Jefferson had them so memorized so completely that when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he quoted verbatim Locke's second treatise on government without consulting the text. So we've seen that, but those beautiful principles of liberty came forth then from that kind of a background. And uh, as, they, as they did, then they were finally institutionalized within this great land and made uh, the basic essence and the vital principles and the doctrines and the concepts 
of not only the Declaration of Independence, but of this great companion document, the U.S. Constitution. And in that sense, then, we have uh, a background that is interesting to note that in that period of time, in the American Revolutionary time, there were also insightful ministers, Christian ministers, who picked up the spirit of liberty and who were closely associated with the Founding Fathers. And these good men had an interesting idea about the coming of the millennium. They didn't think it was next door. He says, the millennium of God, both spoken of in the scriptures, we believe will begin somewhere about 200 years from now, somewhere around the opening of the 21st century. That's what they said. And then they said further, the work that we are doing now as a people and that our political leaders are doing now is preparing the way by establishing an order of freedom in this land an order of freedom that God can use to not only extend the principles of liberty throughout the world, but that God can use as a framework, a setting, for the restoration of the true Church of Jesus Christ on this land of America. And you have men like Jefferson writing, expressing the view that on this land of America, God would restore Christianity to its primitive purity. And then they looked westward, many of them, at the great western plains. And keep in mind, we're just dealing with the eastern seaboard at that particular time, the Appalachians on east. And some of them then looked westward and said, there's a vast land out there. There's a heartland of this great continent. And it's designed in the economy of God that... Uh, as uh, Berkeley, for example, said, westward the course of empire makes its way. And uh, Berkeley's great statement there, and he's the man after which Berkeley University is down here in California is, is named. But as he as he got his vision there, he was reading the second chapter of Daniel, where the kingdom of God would be set up after the feet and the toes, and then the rock that would be cut out of the mountain. Uh, would be cut out from Western America. Now, those views are of interest, and they had two basic ideas. One, that the further development of God's work, and they looked at this as God's work, the further development of God's work in their day required two things. Number one, the further extension of political liberty. And the Founding Fathers laid the foundation of this nation. They were not acting for America alone. They expressed in letters to each other and in public utterances that they were acting for the whole of humanity, and that these great principles, as the prophet Joseph Smith later wrote in section 98 and 101, belong to all mankind. Now, the second thing, then, that they anticipated was the quest for greater spiritual truths that would result ultimately in bringing the Christian Church back on earth with the fullness of the gospel of Christ, and that America had this destiny to perform these two great missions in the world, to extend liberty and to be a foundation for God to restore his church. And in that sense, then, as we look at this work and we see it, and let's take a look at what the Latter-day Saints say and feel about it. Here's a statement, for example, by President Benson. He says, shortly after President Spencer W. Kimball became president of the Church, he assigned me to go into the vault of the St. George Temple and check the early records. As I did so, I realized the fulfillment of a dream I had had since learning of the visit of the Founding Fathers to the St. George Temple. I saw with mine own eyes the record of the work which was done by the Founding Fathers of this great nation, beginning with George Washington. Think of it. The Founding Fathers of this nation, those great men, appearing within those sacred walls, and had their vicarious work done for them. President Wilford Woodruff spoke of the, in these words. Before I left St. George, says President Woodruff, the spirits of the dead gathered around me, wanted to know why we did not regain them. Said they, 
you have had use of the endowment house for a number of years, and yet nothing has been done for us. We laid the foundation of the government you now enjoy, and we never apostatized from it, but we remain true to it and were faithful to God. These were the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and they waited on me for two days and for two nights. I straightway went into the baptismal font and called, the brother, called upon Brother McAllister to baptize me for the signers of the Declaration of Independence and fifty other eminent men. These noble spirits came there with, the, with, the, with divine permission, evidence that this work of salvation goes forward on both sides of the veil. Now that's the view of things that we have, and so we should rest sure in the knowledge that George Washington is a good Mormon, and so is Jefferson. Jefferson didn't sign the Declaration of Independence out of it. He was over in France at the time. But these brethren are good Latter day Saints. And I, I long then for the time to finally come when I get the Lord's work gets through as far as I'm concerned. To get over there and see how it happened. They got together with Joseph Smith, see? And what their relationship is. I mean, that, that's going to be a happy time. Well, in all of this then, the most, as President Benson says, the most important single function of government is to secure the rights and freedom of individual citizens. And the Constitution did that. Now, the reason I'm coming back to that is simply this, that this great work that we're involved in is a continuation of the work of the Founding Fathers. And I thought there's a whole continuity, clear from the time of the Renaissance, uh, the birth of liberty coming on up to America, and then these men had the vision that this was a preparatory thing. And as you study these things in detail, and then you study Joseph Smith in detail, the obvious conclusion that just overwhelmingly arises is this, that Joseph Smith was the next step forward in the divine march of human events guided by divine providence. The restoration of the gospel is the next great major step forward in the proclamation of that message. And then, as we move into our time, and we see the events of our time, the great major uh, picture prophetically of the future, while it entails great judgments, and while it will see great distress, nevertheless, is another major step forward. And it will finally result, not too long after getting underway, in the whole of America being placed under the holy priesthood of God. And you imagine what kind of that program that would be if you had the whole of America finally under the priesthood of God with the new Jerusalem built and Zion raised as an ensign in the standards of the world. Now, that's not too far off. In fact, prophetically, that's one of the major developments of the next few years in that too far distant future. And so let's look at it now in that light. Now this will have its uh, significance and its center then around the battle to save the Constitution. And that's a major uh, upcoming conflict that we as Latter day Saints have to face and I hope sincerely will face uh, in the right way. Uh, let me read you two or three statements on the, on the subject. Here's one from uh, the prophet Joseph Smith as he was talking to some of the brethren and the idea was expressed that the Constitution would uh, be torn to pieces and finally just uh, finally uh, rejected and finally be a thing of the past. He says, no, we will sustain it. Where, he said, and then turning on his heels majestically pointing, he said, in the far west, beyond the Rocky Mountains, in the valleys, hid up like a nest of kittens in the grass. I kind of like that one. <laughs> hid up like a nest of kittens in the grass. We will raise the flag and support the Constitution. Now, uh, it's that kind of thing, and it will be out of conflict. Here, for example, is a statement by Orson Pratt, 1877. Now, this is 11 years after the Civil War had taken place. And he says, that war, the Civil War, 
we must remember there is only one solitary judgment compared with that which will come. It has been revealed that the time will come in the history of our nation that one state will rise against another, one city against another, even every man's hand shall be against his neighbor. Complete breakdown of the order of things. If a war of this description should take place, who would carry on his business in safety? Who would feel safe to put his crops in the ground or to carry on any enterprise? There would be fleeing from one state to another, and general confusion would exist throughout the whole republic. Such eventually is to be the condition of this whole nation if the people do not repent of their wickedness. Here's President John Taylor. Uh, as he speaks of the same general subject, 1879. He was president of the church at that time. Brigham Young died, as you know, in 1877. And so we're talking now about the presiding authority among the Latter-day Saints. He says, Need we be surprised that they should trample and defeat the Constitution of the United States? No. Joseph Smith told us they would do it. Many around me here knew long ago that they uh, would do the thing, and further knew that the last uh, that that the last people that should be found to rally around that sacred instrument and save it from the grasp of unrighteous men would be the elders of Israel. Not the idea that we don't go back to Washington D.C. to save it. President Benson, I know they ought to say this or not, but he gave a, a talk on BYU campus about the only talk I think he's given in the uh, real politics. And in the course of the talk, he makes this statement that the Constitution will not be saved in Washington. Rather, it will be saved by the honest and sincere and conscientious people within the country of America, with the Latter-day Saints playing a very significant role in that. All right, he says, No, Joseph taught us that they would, what they would do. And he says, When therefore we see these things progressing, we would we be astonished? I do not think we, we need be. Were we surprised when the last terrible war took place here in the United States, that is, the Civil War? No, good Latter-day Saints were not, for they had been told about it. But I tell you today, the end is not yet. You will see worse things than that. There is yet to come the sound of war, trouble and distress, in which brother will be arrayed against brother, father against son, son against father, a scene of desolation and destruction that will permeate our land until it will be a vexation to hear the report thereof. Now here's President George Q. Cannon. The day will come, and this is another prediction of Joseph Smith, when good government, constitutional government, liberty, will be found among the Latter-day Saints, and it will be sought for in vain elsewhere. When the Constitution is land, Republican government and Constitution will yet held by this people who are now so oppressed and whose destruction is now sought so diligently. The day will come when the Constitution and free government under it will be sustained and preserved by this people. And that's the general picture. But the point I want to make now is in connection with these developments, apparently, that the Lord begins to make his appearance among the Latter-day Saints. And we think about the second coming, as we indicated last evening, I think it was, and as President Benson has made clear, there's a series of appearances. Christ comes to the saints first. And after he is coming to the saints, developing the program there, then he comes to the Jews to redeem them and to establish the same order in Jerusalem that the saints have been building up here in America. And then after that, months after that, actually not too many, but at least months after that, then he will come in his glory in the clouds of heaven. Now, what I'm concerned about is about Christ coming to the saints. And what I'm concerned about is what is the evidence of how that's going to take place and uh, when we might accept it. Let me read you a statement here from uh, the journal of Charles L. Walker, who is the poet laureate of uh, Utah's Dixie. Under date of January the 21st, 1881. At night, he says, went to prayer meeting. And then he talks about one of the brethren who knew the prophet Joseph Smith speaking. And uh, he says, uh, 
he spoke in a very edifying manner of Joseph Smith marking out the way that the saints would travel to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, the saints being at the time in Nauvoo. And there's other historical evidence on this, that when the prophet, just before his martyrdom, was talking about the West, then he marked out an exact path where the saints would move to. But his finger in the Iowa Territory, where we now would speak of winter quarters, and says, oh, you'll, you'll winter for, for the year, for that winter. And then he put his finger on the Salt Lake Valley and indicated that that uh, would be where they would finally establish a resting place. He went so far even as to draw a map of those things, and the Mormon battalion men had a copy of that map, so that when they were discharged from their responsibility, they knew where to go, they knew where to go in order to find the saints, and this was the Great Salt Lake Basin. You see that? Also, this good brother talks about that. Then he goes on and says, he showed that the Savior would not come initially with power and great glory, as it is spoken out in the scriptures, to the vengeance, to uh, the vengeance, uh, on, to take vengeance on the wicked, and them that knew uh, him not, but would come and pay his uh, his saints a visit in some holy place prepared for him. And about that time, the government of the United States and the Constitution would be broken and hanging on a thread, as it were, and the saints of the Most High would step forward and save it from being trampled down by men of misrule. So apparently from this report on the Prophet Joseph Smith, he ties in the beginning of Christ coming in the area of open manifestations at the time of these great difficulties. Here's a statement. This one is from the Historical Department of the Church, and it's a letter written by Amanda H. Wilcox to the daughter of Brigham Young, Susan Gates, Susan Young Gates, and it's dated March 11, 1904, so it's a little while after Brigham Young had died, but Amanda Wilcox was right there at the time of the events she describes, and she's now writing to sister Susan Young Gates. Uh, apparently to fulfill a promise, because she had mentioned to it verbally to her. She says, To fulfill my promise to you, I will tell you what your father, that is, Brigham Young, said to me, in company with Brother Heber C. Kimball in City Creek Canyon in the year 1861. In the latter part of July, Brother Brigham and Heber came into my house, and were talking on the war of races, meaning the blacks and the whites. 1861 is the beginning of the Civil War. Your father said at the time, They are giving us a rest, but it will not be long. Turning to me, he asked, Sister Amanda, did you ever wish you had been with the saints in their driving from Nauvoo? See, that was a status symbol once. I mean, you'd endured that persecution. And, uh, and she responds, No, sir. And they both looked surprised and said, I was the first of the English saints they had ever saw, uh, heard say so, and I asked why. I said, I believe with all my heart that to live a good saint, it will require as great courage as it did in the driving from Nauvoo before we get through. Then Brigham Young said, Yes and more, for the trials of the saints will be harder to bear. He further said, when our brethren, the quorum of the Twelve, or the Twelve Apostles, shall be called to the courts of Washington to give an account of the position of the Latter-day Saints, he says, then look out, for the world will be in commotion, and the Lord will have something to work upon. The Lord will hear the prayers of his children. It will be after this, he says, when our Savior and others will be, make their appearance on the earth among the Latter-day Saints. And so, as I see it, at least, the picture of Christ coming to Zion is a kind of a gradual picture, to meet uh, existing circumstances and to give personal direction to his prophet from time to time. Now, note, for example, we've read this uh, passage, I think, sometime today or yesterday. I'm getting a little hazy as to what I talked about in a given hour. But in section 103 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord here speaks of the... Uh, uh, the redemption of Zion, 
And uh, this great prophetic picture, then, is important. Uh, let me read it again with the idea now of focusing in on this issue of Christ's coming. He says, Behold, I say unto you, the redemption of Zion must needs come by power. It will have to. The circumstances will be such. It will have to be like the Israelites being delivered out of Egypt. Power will have to be a factor in that redemption and that deliverance. He says, Therefore, I will raise up unto my people a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. For ye are the children of Israel, and the seed of Abraham, and ye must needs be led out as bondage by power and with a stretched out arm. And then note what he says, And as your fathers were led at the first, he's talking now about the ancient Israelites, you go back and pick up the picture there, as they went out of Egypt, they went with the cloud by day and the clay fire by night, they went by the direction of the living prophet who was communing personally and directly with the Lord. And the Lord essentially was immediately involved in that program. He says, And as our fathers were led at the first, even so shall the redemption of Zion be. Wherefore, let not your hearts faint. For I say not unto you, as I said unto your fathers, Mine angel shall go up before you, but not my presence. But I say unto you, Mine angels, plural, shall go up before you, and also my presence, his glory. And with that then, I suspect to the living prophet then his person, directing those events. Uh, angels shall go up before you, and also my presence, and in time you shall possess the goodly land. Now, these are further developments, and there will be a growth and development of the saints spiritually, and an opening more continually of the revelations of God from heaven, and Christ personally involved and appearing from time to time to give direction and inspiration. Now, all of this also, after the saints get back to Jackson County, then uh, the angel Moroni gives us some information that's very vital on the subject that relates not merely to the coming, for example, of the ten tribes, but he also speaks now of the coming of Christ to Zion, and uh, identifies now as a heavenly messenger when Christ will finally come and take up his residence in Zion. These earlier things that we've talked about apparently are merely appearances and manifestations along the way. The day after the initial appearances of Moroni to the prophet Joseph Smith, you recall that the prophet then went to the hill Kenora. He went with dollar signs in his eyes. I mean, you can, you can see the circumstances why in some measure. Uh, for example, after the prophet got the place, if I can just interpolate this little story into the picture, he invited Martin Harris, because the Lord had instructed him to do it, to come over and help him with the work of translation. And so Martin paid him a visit. The prophet had the plates at home, had them boxed up in an old Ontario glass box. And that has a little interesting history in itself that I won't get into. But uh, they were boxed up in an old Ontario glass box. And he allowed Martin to pick the box up and shake it and rattle it. And he could tell that there were metallic things in there because he could feel and hear the rattle, you know. And he's shaking it back and forth, and the plates are inside. And uh, after conversion with the prophet for Eden, and he headed down home, and he was walking home. This is how he reasoned. He says, I could tell by the weight of the contents of that box that it had to either be lead or gold. And I knew. The Smith family didn't have enough money to buy that much lead. <laughs> Therefore, I had to conclude that there was some validity to what Joseph Smith said about the gold plates. Now, that's the humble circumstances the prophet was in, see? And so when he went to the Hill Camorra, the day after the initial appearances of the he went with dollar signs in his eyes. But he was checked up rather severely as he reached in for the plates. He felt an electrical shock. <laughs> Prophet being a dynamic, energetic, and powerful person, made another effort at it, and another one, and finally he made a real effort at it, with the expression, expressed bravely, why can't I get these things? And at that he found himself laying on his back, so he to the side of the sacred repository, and he looked up there, it's Moroni. Moroni says, the reason you can't is because you haven't kept the commandments of the Lord. And then, in his mercy, the Lord opened the vision of things 
uh, to the future to Joseph Smith. And then I took up another session of instructing him. Uh, he says, uh, for instance, I'll give you a sign concerning this work. When these things begin to be known, that is, when it's known that the Lord has shown you these things, the workers of iniquity will seek your overthrow. They will circulate thoughts who destroy your reputation and also will seek to take your life. Now, that's a, you know, that's one fine sign to get concerning the truthfulness of the word. And he says, uh, uh, but he says, remember this, if you are faithful and shall hereafter continue to keep the commandments of the Lord, you shall be preserved to bring these things forth, for in due time we will again give you commandment to come and take them. And they are interpreted. The Lord will give the holy priesthood the Son. Now that's a prophetic statement foreshadowing the restoration of priesthood in this dispensation. The Lord will give the holy priesthood the Son, and they shall begin to proclaim this gospel, and baptize by water, and after they shall have power to give the Holy Ghost by the laying out of hands. Then will persecution rage more and more. And he talks then about the developing of the church in this dispensation on down through. He says it will increase the more opposed and spread farther and farther, increasing in knowledge until they shall be sanctified and receive an inheritance where the glory of God shall rest upon them. Now, he's talking here of the saints finally getting back to Jackson County, with the cloud by day and the fire by night. And he makes this now a point of reference of very important significance. He says, when this takes place, when the saints receive an inheritance where the glory of God rests upon them, when this takes place, and we're talking now about Jackson County, the return of the saints there, he says the ten tribes of Israel will be revealed in the north country where they have been for a long season. Now, it's not time for the ten tribes to come in, but they're going to come as a body. And then he adds a further comment. <clears throat> and when this is fulfilled, that is, when the ten tribes make their appearance, when this is fulfilled, we will be brought to pass the saying of the prophet Isaiah, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Now, when will Christ come to Zion? He will come to Zion. He will make some preliminary appearances, but he will come to Zion after the redemption of Zion, after the return of the ten tribes. Then he will come to Zion. Now, we haven't discussed this yet. I hope maybe tomorrow evening we can get into it. And that is the great harvest season as portrayed in the Book of Mormon and in the Book of Revelation and the Doctrine and Covenants gives us such a vitally important key on the Book of Revelation in section 77. And that's the reason I would like to discuss it with you to give the prophets insights on that subject. But uh, the basic picture is this, that when Zion is redeemed, the ten tribes return, then out of the sanctified people of Zion, the remnant that we've talked about, those people who endure the tribulation, those people who are made pure by the judgments, and those people then who go to Jackson County, and then with the coming of the ten tribes, then you will select that great body of men we refer to as the 134,000. And when they've been selected, then John makes it very clear, reads Revelation chapter 7 and 8, that then the opening of the seventh seal will take place. And it's right after the opening of the seventh seal, or in connection with it, that Christ will come and dwell in Zion. And there will be silence in heaven for the space of half an hour of the Lord's time, which will be about twenty-one years plus. And during that twenty-one years plus, when the agony of heaven looks on the circumstances of this world in calm silence, and the work of the 144,000 goes forward in gathering people into the church of the firstborn, then during that period Christ will be in Zion, preparing the saints and educating them concerning his divine plan and program. 
And after he comes then, after the work of the 144,000, then Malachi says, the Lord whom we seek will suddenly come to his temple. And uh, the Savior then will make his appearance in the Jackson County Temple. Talking here not about mysterious things, but about having to elevate the program on from here on up to there. And the only reason I'm doing that is, is to get some understanding and comprehension of where we are and where we're going. Let me go back for a minute with the ten tribes. There are three statements that are authoritative, as I see it, regarding the coming of the ten tribes. One of them I have read to you. That is the, the explanation of Moroni. And that's a pretty good source of authority. Let me turn with you to 3 Nephi chapter 21. Maybe we ought to start with chapter 20, uh, at least verse 22 in chapter 20, where the Lord speaking to the Nephites says here in verse 22, Behold this people, where I establish in this land, under the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob. And that's an interesting thing. But clear back with Jacob, the Lord made a covenant concerning what he's here speaking about. And he says, and it should be a new Jerusalem. See, Jacob knew about the new Jerusalem then, and the Lord made covenant with him, that when his seed run over the wall, as Genesis 49 says, to this land of the everlasting hills, to this land where there's a chain of mountains from the north to the south pole, which is called the land of the everlasting hills. When they run over the wall into this land, then this would be the land where the new Jerusalem would be built. And apparently Jacob knew that. And he says, And shall be called a new Jerusalem, and the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people. Yea, even I will be in the midst of you. Now will Christ come to the saints in the new Jerusalem? He will, before he comes in glory? Absolutely. Years before he comes in glory, see? And when we talk about preparing for the coming of the Lord, then we're not talking about the preparing is coming in glory. At least I don't have any particular interest in that. Uh, I do, you know, in the sense of knowledge and understanding. The thing I'm concerned about is getting my life ready to ride the Colorado Rapids in the leaky bathtub without an oil. And that's just about the way it will be. When you have only one thing to look for, and that's the God of heaven looking down on you in mercy to get you through the program, see? And then to prepare my soul to grow and develop so that I can be worthy to enjoy some of the greater blessings of the Spirit that will then be poured out. And if I live long enough, and I don't know how long my old timbers are going to hang on if I keep talking as loud and long as I do, but if I live long enough, then, or if my children live, then in the not too far distant future we may have the company of the Savior in our midst. Now that's a beautiful thought, and we need to get that thought in our mind. As Isaiah spoke of it for him, for example, let me turn my hold this thing for a minute and go back to Isaiah. This is Isaiah 59, and let me suggest that you start with verse 20 at least. And uh, uh, read what he has to say. Now let's go back to verse 19. He says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. And he's talking about the warfare against Zion here. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And then he says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. All right, so the, leader, the Redeemer then is going to come to Zion. Now over here in 3 Nephi 21, Jesus comes back to this same theme, and he talks about the building of the new Jerusalem, and about the Gentiles, pure Gentiles, helping uh, the remnant of Lehi, who in turn then are under the direction of and assist those who hold the keys of priesthood of Ephraim, to build the new Jerusalem. 
And then he says, They will assist my people that they may be gathered in, and read in verse 24, who were scattered upon all the face of the land, in and to the new Jerusalem. Now, the new Jerusalem isn't just one city, it's a complex of cities. And so the gather into the new Jerusalem is to implement this divine program of building cities of Zion, as stakes of Zion, throughout the land. And he says, And then shall the power of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in their midst. So the Savior will be there, again affirming that he will be present. Now, having said this, then he indicates that the great work of gathering will take place in relation to uh, bringing the house of Israel out from among the nations, and also the work of integrating in, making part of the divine program, the lost tribes of Israel. Note how he puts it in verse 26, Then shall the work of the Father commence at that day, even when this gospel shall be preached among the remnants of this people, yea, verily I say unto you, at that day shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people, even, yea, even the tribes which have been lost, which the Father had led away out of Jerusalem. I know he didn't scatter them, he led them away. And they're in the body. He says, Yea, the work shall commence among all the dispersed of my people, with the Father prepare the way whereby they may come unto me, that they may call on the Father in my name. And they shall, and then shall the work of the Father commence, commence with the Father among all nations, and prepare in the way whereby his people may be guided home to the land of their inheritance. And they shall go out from among all nations, and they shall not go out in haste, nor go by flight, for I will go before them. So if the Father and I will be their real word. Now when they gather, then they gather to the new Jerusalem. But in order to gather Israel, you've got to do things. Two things are necessary. One, you've got to cleanse this land of its corruption. Because this is the land of promise. And that promise is that God is going to build the new Jerusalem on this land. The second thing you have to do is prepare the saints to rise to that higher level of spirituality. And this, then, is the refiner's fire. It's interesting, for example, in the Book of Mormon, that when the Lord talks about the, uh, the, the uh, building of the New Jerusalem, then he puts Isaiah 54 in there, as we quoted last night, single bear, and thou that is not bear, and the extension of, of the New Jerusalem program. And then along with that, he puts the book of Malachi in it. Now, we've got the book of Malachi in the Bible, and the Lord knew he would have it there, but he puts it in there. Why? Chapters 3 and 4. Not because of the law of tithing, and Nephites had that. You can get the law of tithing uh, from Alec 18. They had it, see? But he put Malachi in there, I believe at least, to remind us that all of these things are going to be dependent on a refining process. He says, The Lord will come suddenly to his temple. But then he adds, But who may abide the day of his coming? And that's a tremendously significant question. And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like refiner's fire and like fuller soap, and he will purge and purify the sons of Levi as gold and silver until they then are pure before him. Now, that refining process is already underway on a private, individual basis. I've seen evidence upon evidence in my life for the last ten years or better that the Lord is beginning to work, refining some souls. And it's done through adversity, it's done through challenge, it's done through contradiction, and it's done in such a way that you finally have to face the issue whether you really believe in Christ and his living prophet or not. And in that sense, then, we're already in the beginnings of the stream of the refiner's fire, see? But uh, the, the ten tribes, then, will be brought in in connection with this. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, we have some very beautiful clarifications on this whole picture. It tells us, for example, about their return. And it says this, 
They who are in the north countries, verse 26 of section 133, shall come in remembrance before the Lord, and their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves. And they shall smite the rocks, and the ice shall throw down at their presence, and an highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep. That's the ocean. That's not the highway going up to Alaska. I remember when I was a kid, and the Alaskan highway was built, and a lot of good saints just bear their testimony of their thankfulness for living in the last days, seeing the highway built that the untamed tribes would come down through. But that's not what the scripture says. A highway will be cast up in the midst of the great deep, and in the barren deserts there will come forth pools of living water. I seldom travel from Utah and down through Nevada or Arizona. I don't think of this and wonder what this whole area is going to look like when this is fulfilled. And he says, And the parched land shall no longer be a thirsty land, and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants. And the boundaries of everlasting hills shall tremble at their presence. And there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hand of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Israel, or of Ephraim. Now, two or three clarifications. Number one, they're going to be crowned with glory. They're not going to be converted to the gospel. They've already got prophets in their midst. The prophet Joseph Smith had an hour and a half talk with John the Revelator. Now, I'd be a privilege to kind of sit down on that one, wouldn't it? And John told him that he was working among the ten tribes, and that he was their priest and their king. Now, the ten tribes then will come. They will not come to be converted to the gospel. They will come to be crowned with glory. And crowned with glory means those final ultimate ordinances and powers of the holy priesthood by which they get the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And that presupposes they'll have the gospel and they'll have temples and they'll have eternal marriage and they'll have those that come, at least many of them, a pure people. And when they come to Zion, they're crowned with glory. They wait, as Moroni says, after Zion has been purified and, and the finds the resting place and is endowed with the glory of the Lord, then the ten tribes come in, and then they get their crowning with glory from the children of Ephraim. And then you have the setting for this great mission, not missionary corps, but this great priesthood corps to be called out, the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. See? Then you've got a basis to do that. And as the book of Revelation tells us very clearly, this is done in the very latter period of time of the 6,000-year period from the fall of Adam. And the opening of the seventh seal then begins the great work of the harvest season. And that's when uh, uh, they go forth and gather people into the uh, church of the firstborn. Or they shall fall down and be crowned with glory by the children of Ephraim, even the servants of the Lord, and so forth. And they shall be so filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, this is the blessing of everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel, and the richer blessing upon Ephraim and his fellows. And the reason the richer blessing upon Ephraim, I think we made this comment before, is because Ephraim has borne the brunt of the heat of the day. Ephraim was that body of people who finally got sanctified and up to a level to start with, and who built Zion, and uh, from Ephraim, the birthright tribe then, these higher blessings of the gospel will go to other tribes of Israel, including the ten tribes and the Indian people and others, and hence then the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim. Now when Christ then comes to his temple, he will come to his temple in order to put the capstone on that great program that has been built up that we call Zion, which is an order of kings and priests. Now, I touched on that this afternoon, but I think it's important enough to turn back to it here in the teachings, page 340. I'll just review a few ideas on that and, and build on to it a little if we can. When we talk about building the King of God, keep in mind that the church organization was completed in 1836. 
And then after it was completed, <coughs> then you have Moses and Elias and Elijah coming, restoring the keys by which this uh, eternal celestial family order that's built up in the temple could be built. Now, in relation to the building of this family order, then there's the manifestation of three kinds of power or levels of power. The first is called the spirit of Elias. Now, what's the spirit of Elias? Well, it's that spirit that a young man gets when he gets a call to go on a mission. It requires him to leave his girlfriend to his returning boyfriend who's just getting home from the mission. And he has enough courage and enough uh, spiritual sensitivity with the Spirit of the Lord to, ha to heed that call and to kind of leave her for that period of time and to go out into the mission field and to have the spirit of teaching the gospel and bringing people to Christ. Now, that is the spirit of Elias, see? Now, what's the spirit of Elijah? Well, it's not just genealogical research. The spirit of Elijah is the spirit of the celestial family. It's the spirit of home evening. It's the spirit of union between a husband and his wife and his family. And it's the spirit then that extends beyond that family uh, to others of their family here in mortality and then on back through the work for salvation for the dead to their kindred dead. And all that's associated with it. And uh, in its capstone program, in its ultimate program, is the spirit that you find in the house of the Lord, where there's peace and where there's serenity, and not just a calmness of peace, but a living, vibrant, and dynamic peace where it's alive with the spirit of love and union, and where you begin to feel the presence of, of God and of Christ. Now, this is the spirit of Elijah. And so Joseph says, then, the spirit of Elias is first. You've got to get those missionaries out. You've got to get them born again. You've got to get them baptized and into the program. And then the spirit of Elijah is second, and Messiah last. Now, there's those three expressions of power. The power of the spirit of Elias, which is the missionary spirit. The power of the spirit of Elijah, with all its ramifications and its center then in the celestial family. And then that of Messiah. All right, he says Elias is a forerunner to prepare the way. And the spirit and power of Elijah is to come after holding the keys of power, building the temple, and the word temple now is a symbol, as the prophet is using it, for the holy order built in the house of the Lord. Building the temple, that is the holy order, to the capstone. Now, to the capstone doesn't mean putting on the capstone. It means putting it right up there, to where the next thing on over it is to put the capstone. And he says, placing the seals of the Melchizedek priesthood upon the house of Israel, not just Ephraim, upon the house of Israel. And you can't have Christ come to his temple until after the ministry of the 144,000. Why? Because it's their way to bring Israel into the church of the firstborn and to give them the spirit and blessings and power of Elijah, including the sealing powers. And when they finish their work, then Christ can come suddenly to his temple. And what's the purpose for his coming? It's to put the capstone on. And what's the capstone? The capstone, then, is to make them in actual fact kings and priests and queens and priestesses. Now, there are four things that we need to keep in mind. And I don't think I'm talking too far out of school. I'm just endeavoring to do this now to get the idea in our mind so we can see where we are. We can see where we are not only historically but prophetically, see? And then you've got some kind of stability in your life, some basis to have hope and to meet the challenges of life, if you know where you are in relation to time and space and the prophetic picture. And so we need to talk then about this just a little bit. Now, there are four things. Number one, it's one thing to be washed and anointed preparatory to becoming a king and a priest to rule and reign with Christ in the house of Israel. That's one thing. 
And I've been involved in that sacred work at least two days a week, and it's been a beautiful experience, and it is a beautiful experience, see, to have that sacred responsibility and to stand there in those initiatory stalls, if I can call them that, and wonder what the ultimate and eternal consequences of what you're doing is going to be. But it's one thing to anoint a person to become a king and a priest, and a woman, a queen, and a priestess. That's one thing. Now it's another thing for that person then, having gone on and fulfilled the purpose of that in receiving the endowment and eternal marriage, it's a second thing for a person, or for a couple, better stated, to make their calling and election sure to that sacred relationship, and to receive the invitation of the Prophet of the Lord and come back and have the contingency clauses taken out. Make your calling and election sure to be a king and a priest and a queen and priestess. Now that's the work of the 144,000. That's what they do. That's what they will be doing. And then it's a third thing for Christ to come to his temple and say, Okay, all of you folks who have had your calling and election sure to this sacred relationship, I want to call you now into a meeting in the sacred house or temple of Jackson County. And when he gets there, then by virtue of the spirit and power of Elijah, and here's what the prophet said about it, or the spirit and power of Messiah, he says, the spirit of Messiah is all power in heaven and in earth, enthroned in heaven as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so by virtue of that power, then, he makes them in actual fact kings and priests and queens and priestesses. Now, what's the value of that? Well, he's going to reign on this earth, and uh, through whom and by whom will he reign? He's going to reign as king of kings, and who are the kings over whom he's going to reign? And through whom he's going to reign? And they are those, then, who have been prepared through the ministry of Zion, to they are those then who have been gathered in, and who have been made kings and priests and queens and priests in actual fact. And then the fourth and final thing will be to actually receive their kingdom under Christ in the millennial period. Now, section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants gives us a few things on this. For example, it talks about Christ coming, yes, in the millennial period. And then in section 88, verse 107, it says this, And then shall the angels be crowned with the, the glory of his might, and the saints shall be filled with his glory, and receive their inheritances, and be made equal with him. Now, their inheritances then consist of their eternal or the millennial kingdom. The kings that they have and over which they preside as kings and priests in the millennial period. See? So going back then to Joseph Smith's statement, he says, Now the spirit of Elias is first, and we're deeply involved in that program with thousands of missionaries. The spirit of Elijah is second, and we need to do more on that, much more on that. And then Messiah last. Elias is the forerunner to prepare the way. And the spirit and power of Elijah is to come after, holding the keys of power, building the temple, that is, the holy order, to the capstone, placing the seals of the Melchizedek priest around the house of Israel, making all things ready. Then Messiah comes to his temple, which is last of all. He says, Messiah is above the spirit and power of Elijah, for he made the world and was the spiritual rock unto Moses in the wilderness. Elijah is to come to a right away. And build up the kingdom of God before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, although the spirit of Elias might begin it. Now, when we get to there, then, we, then we're ready to go to Adam and Diamond. And so the great council of Adam and Diamond has to be after Christ comes to his temple, because it's at Adam and Diamond that not only is there a great judgment of the righteous of all ages, but it's at the Adam and Diamond council that the formation of the dispensation of the fullness of time takes place, and all other dispensations are sealed to this dispensation to make the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, you're not going to seal all other dispensations to a half-completed program or to a Gentile church. 
We're going to seal all other dispensations to a completed program with the capstone on it. And there at that great council of Adam and Diamond, and when this is done, then Daniel speaks of that and speaks of Christ coming in the clouds of heaven and makes this statement, he says, I saw in the night visions and beheld one like the Son of Man, he come, came in the clouds of heaven, came to the ancient of days, that is, Adam, and they brought him near before him. And it was given him, Christ, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all many people, nations, and languages should serve him. Now, not will immediately, but should. This is a preparatory thing. Should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is that which shall not be destroyed. But it's at Adam, at Adam and the Ayaman, where you finally then get things fully ready for the second coming. And uh, the powers are given to Christ, the priesthood of all ages, sustaining him as King of kings and Lord of lords. And they're acting now on the high spiritual level where they themselves are kings unto the King of kings and lords unto the Lord of lords. See? And then he says, all right, now, brethren, now we've got one other great chore to do. We've got to get the Jews into this program. They who were first and had the first opportunity by Christ coming to them and could have had these blessings, they're last as a nation. And so the great program of things will be worked out in relation to Christ coming to the Jews. And when he comes to the Jews and stands upon the Mount of Olives and delivers them, and then finally comes in his glory in the clouds of heaven, Daniel puts it this way in the latter verses of Daniel chapter 7, But the judgments will sit, and they shall take away his, that is, the evil one's, dominion and to consume and destroy it to the end. And the kingdom and dominion of the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High God, whose kingdom was an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions should serve and obey him. All right, but where does this begin, my brothers and sisters? It begins with Zion, does it not? And where are we as a people in relation to this? What faces us in the future? Great challenges and great difficulties, and the prophetic picture is very clear on that. What's the place of safety? Get your life in tune with the living prophet. Get your life in tune with your state president. Get your life in tune with your bishops. And learn to counsel with them, and develop a relationship spiritually where you feel the power coming from priesthood channels and where they know your openness of heart and your sincerity and your devotion. And when you begin really to do that, instead of riding every person his own hobby horse, you find a spiritual strength and a spiritual power in the people that you can distinctly feel. We began to develop some of those things in the Alpine State. And uh, the State Conference, I guess, was the one before last. We didn't have a general authority there. We didn't have anyone but the state presidency there. But when that priesthood meeting, Saturday evening priesthood meeting was over, there was hardly a soul who wanted to leave. The power of the Spirit was just, wow, just, you could just feel it. It just bristles with the Spirit of love, the Spirit of union, the Spirit of power. Now that, my brothers and sisters, is what we're involved in, and that's what we've got to do. And that's the kind of program we've got to develop. And we can't do it as freelance individuals. We've got to do it within the framework of the Holy Priest of God. And may the Lord bless us to see and understand that. And may the Lord bless us to get our sights where they ought to be and not run before we're sent and not run further than we're sent. But to be willing to work on the footings, the concrete, even though you know about the capstone and work and build, brick upon brick, and line upon line, and enjoy the blessings that God has for you in the process. And this will be the way you'll save your soul and refine your lives and sanctify your beings and your homes and your families. And may God bless us all that we each in our respective ways may do this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> If the corner of the prayer is going to be called back to Washington, will it be something uh, the body of the church members will know about, or will it be just 
a secret we will uh, need the spiritual eyes and ears to hear about. I doubt very much it will be very secret. I think it will be that time when the Latter-day Saints finally take a stand to support the Constitution because it's literally being torn and shred uh, asunder. And the time's going to come when we are a people who say, hey, we want to keep it. I don't know how far we can go down the tube as a nation and how much we can rationalize. It's getting to the point that you can't even believe in get a wholesome family and still be a respectable citizen. If you don't believe in the gays and you don't believe in the corruption that goes on and the limitations of families and all of that, you're simply not a good American. You finally get to the point then where that spirit and that attitude finally wants to scrap the Constitution says we've had it 200 years, now we ought to have something different to meet the circumstances of our so-called modern age. And if uh, someone like President Benson says, oh no, let's not do that, what would be the result? You would have some kind of conflict within the Church, and then if the Church took a stand, then the brethren of the Twelve might be invited to speak before the nation, you know, meet the nation. And uh, that kind of program, as I see it at least, and I'm just talking about what I see on this thing then, as I see it then, it will be a major public discussion. And you have them facing the nation, and the nation will reject them. And when the nation rejects the official direction of the prophet of God and his constituted authorities, the Lord will not sustain it any longer. And then you'll have warfare against Zion. I think the the blessing says that I will officiate uh, for the ten tribes when they come to Zion before, for their blessings. What are the possible interpretations of the word officiate? Officiate means acting in the house of the Lord to give them those higher blessings. Now, I don't suspect that the whole ten tribes will be ready to be crowned with glory. I just personally don't believe that. But I think there will be some of them who will get their temple blessings uh, from the saints. But there will be many of them who will just simply receive the final thing uh, of the endowment of glory preparatory then to the full Zion program. So it could be anything on the way up and down, as I see it. Do you believe that the beginning of the seal overlaps the end of the, uh, the seventh seal overlaps the end of the sixth seal? I don't quite know what the question means, but uh, I don't see any overlapping. We're, we're in the latter stage of the sixth seal, and uh, uh, the problem is we don't know exactly the time. We know pretty well that we're on target from the, from the birth of Christ to the present time. We've got statements in the Doctrine of Covenants and from the Prophet Joseph Smith that uh, 1991 is 1991 that we don't know the exact period of time from the fall of Adam down through. And so I don't know whether the opening of the seventh seal will be the year 2000. But even if it is, Christ will not come in his glory then. Even if it is, he might come to the saints, but he won't come in his glory. Not until after the half-hour silence, and then after that are the plagues. And the sixth plague is the gathering of the wicked to Jerusalem. And that plague of itself, the latter phase of it, takes three and a half years. That's only the last part of it. So how long are you going to be involved in those in the coming of Christ and his glory, see? And so we've got a period of time, and we want to talk about that a little more. Ten tribes are lost. They are. Among the people can't quite read the thing. Which? Well, that's a cup section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Please. To do two things. Now, let's make that clear. Two things. Number one. He restored the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth. Now, this is Israel in their scattered state throughout all peoples and nations and lands of the earth. Number two, the leaving of the ten tribes from the land of the north. Now, that's not a gathering. That was a leaving. I was talking about a body. All right, then we have the articles of faith, number 11. What does it say? We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and the restoration of the ten tribes. And then we've got the Book of Mormon. And what does it tell us there? Jesus appeared among the Nephites, and he ministered to them personally, and he gave them then that great sacred experience we have recorded in Third Nephi. And then he said he was going where? To the ten tribes.
and he's going to minister to them. And that's proper in relation to the sequence of things, see? Then he went to them. Now, what did he do? Go on a tracking spree throughout the earth and knock on every door? Or did he go to a body of people like he said he was going to go, see? Now, when you have the redemption of Israel, you have two actions. You have the coming of the ten tribes as a body, and they're crowned with glory in Zion. And that prepares this great priesthood body program where 144,000 selected from every tribe of Israel. And then they go out throughout the nations of the earth and gather people into the church of the firstborn. And when they've completed that and put the seals of the Melchizedek priesthood on the house of Israel, then Christ comes suddenly to his temple and puts the capstone on. And then Adam and down and rose right after that in the midst of the plagues that were being poured out. And then Christ goes to the Jews and redeems them, and then he comes in his glory in the clouds of heaven. Now, that's the prophetic picture, and that's the sequence of things. And it's very, very clear in my day the prophet's thought. Well, it's been a thrill and a pleasure. Pardon? Pardon, I answer them all. I also will the Jews have to accept Jesus as the Messiah before they can be gathered. And the answer is no on the latter point. They will not be, some of them will receive the gospel, and there will be a church at, at, at Jerusalem. A Latter-day Saint desire to be a branch and so forth there, but there will be a, a full bona fide LDS church of Jews who are there. And, uh, but there will be others then who will not, in fact, the big bulk of the Jewish nation will not believe, but they will gather in unbelief. Moses led the people out of one, uh, out as one group, hire one man lead uh, when we are not in one body. Those people who go back to Jackson County will not consist of all the Latter-day Saints. The whole of America is Zion. That includes Snowflake, Arizona, and Alpine, Utah. And we've got each our real estate here. And the Lord wants us to hang on to that. We've got too much of the blood of Israel to just walk off and leave it, see? And the great program of raising, of going back and redeeming Jackson County is to build the center place. And why build the center place? To establish a program where the glory of the Lord is there, and where people have done the program, where they get the glory of the Lord. And then when that program, which will be the administrative hub, has been established, then there will be a reverse action, so that every stake of Zion that's established before that on the lesser program will be brought up to that higher program. And every state of Zion is organized thereafter will be brought on that program. And they will begin to partake then of the blessings of the Holy Spirit in the endowment of glory that Zion's supposed to have. You see that? But when you go back to Jackson County, is everyone going to go? Even all the worthy? And the answer is no. We're going to go back there to do a job. How do you discover that silence in heaven for the space of half an hour is the time of the Lord rather than time on the earth? It says it clearly in the statement. There will be a half hour of silence in heaven. And you have some other clarifications by brethren on the subject. I think that completes us all, uh, and we're over time. Thanks for your attention. We'll give you five minutes, I guess, and then we'll get back on uh, the program in relation to the Jews and in relation to his coming and glory.